Hello, I am Seema and welcome to part 2 of the chapter Metals and Non-Metals. In part 1, I told you that it is possible to classify elements on the basis of their physical properties. But we found that there was a problem when we classified elements on the basis of their physical properties. And it became essential that we move on and go deeper into the study of metals and non-metals and classify them on the basis of their chemical properties. Now, for example, I look outside the window and I say, that's the sky and that's the earth. What is the basis of me saying that that's the sky and that's the earth? Just by looking at it physically from what knowledge I have that whatever is under my feet is the earth and whatever I see up there is the sky. I do not have much more information to give about it. So when you talk of physical properties, it is somewhat like looking only at the, uh, at the aspects that are visible to us. But there's no reasoning behind them. We do not give a reason for that. For example, what were the physical properties that we discussed yesterday? The first was that metals have luster, they are hard, they are malleable, they are ductile, they are good conductors of heat, they are good conductors of electricity, and they are sonorous. We did seven properties. But we notice that many elements, whether they are metals or non-metals, they show anomalies and they do not stick strictly to these properties of uh, these physical properties of metals and non-metals that we discussed. So we study these under the exceptions. They are the exceptions. They are not following the rules. So what are these exceptions? Let us see them and then let us see what is the need of studying chemical properties. That is what we'll be doing in this video. We start with the study of exceptions. We say that all metals exist as solids. Metals are solids. This is our common knowledge. Metal, if you take a metal and iron rod and aluminum foil or gold, silver, you talk of metals and what comes to your mind is solids. But there's one metal that is mercury, which is a liquid. So that is an exception. It is not following the regular physical properties of metals. The second exception is that metals, they say, have high melting points and boiling points. Because if you take an, a rod, uh, that's the reason why we, uh, if you put a metal uh, piece or like you put a spoon into a flame and you try to melt it, it, it requires a very high temperature to really melt a piece of metal. Because they have very high melting points and boiling points. Yet, we have such exceptions here. Gallium and cesium are two metals which are which have such low melting points, they're not liquids at room temperature, they're definitely solids. But if, if, if you hold them in the palm of your hand, just by the heat of the palm of your hand, they start melting. So they have very low melting points in comparison to the other, uh, other metals. The third exception is iodine. Iodine is a non-metal. And we say that metals have luster, they have shine, and non-metals do not have luster. But iodine is a non-metal, yet it has luster. It shines. The next exception, carbon, it exists in allotropic forms. Before I explain this point to you, let me tell you what allotropic forms are. Carbon is an element. When the same element is present in different forms, and those different forms are because of a, of a difference in the arrangement of the atoms of that element. Those forms are known as different allotropic forms. So allotropes are nothing but the same element in which the arrangement of atoms is different due to which its physical properties are different. Allotropic forms, they are the same element and the difference is only in the physical properties. Chemically, the allotropic forms are made up of the same element. Therefore, chemically, they will do the same reactions. They will have the same reactions. They will make the same products. But if you look at them physically, they have different physical properties. For example, carbon is present in the form of two main allotropic forms. There are other forms also. But the main allotropic forms are diamond and graphite. Graphite is uh, the lead that you have in your pencils, the pencil lead. That is graphite. We call it lead while actually it is graphite. It's a, a form of a carbon in which the arrangement is in the form of layers. So when you write with the help of a pencil, the layers, they keep coming off 
and they form a mark on the paper that you're writing on. So graphite is one allotropic form of carbon and diamond, diamonds that you make jewelry uh, with, diamonds are shiny hard rocks and that other form, allotropic form of carbon is diamond. Both diamond and graphite would show same chemical properties. So if you burn both of them, both of them are carbon, they will burn and form carbon dioxide. So both of them are chemically the same but physically they are so different. Diamond is the hardest known substance. It is the hardest known substance. And graphite? Graphite is so slippery that it is used as a lubricant in auto parts. The same element but the difference in physical properties is so drastic. So the presence of allotropic forms and the difference in their uh, physical properties itself will confuse you when you are trying to classify elements on the basis of uh, their physical properties. So this can be confusing and there is another thing that you should know about diamond. We say non-metals are not hard while metals are very hard yet diamond is an allotropic form of carbon and carbon is a non-metal so we said in the form of diamond carbon is the hardest known substance although it is a non-metal similarly we say that graphite is a non-metal it's made up of carbon and we say that metals are good conductors of electricity while non-metals are bad conductors of electricity yet graphite is a non-metal and it is one of the best conductors of electricity. So we find such extremes in the exceptions that it is, it feels that classifying elements on the basis of physical properties is not such a good idea. Yet to begin with, it is interesting, it is fun to see the general differences between metals and non-metals on the basis of their physical properties. The last exception is that we say alkali metals are hard, sorry, metals are hard. But alkali metals, you remember, I told you in part one that alkali metals are the metals which fall in the first group of the periodic table. You'll be doing periodic classification of elements. So they fall in the first group and these metals, they, can, they are so soft that they can be cut with the help of a knife. They are so soft that you could cut them with the help of a knife. For example, you have lithium, you have potassium, you have sodium. These are alkali metals which are really, really soft. And that's the reason why the idea of classifying metals uh, elements into metals and non-metals on the basis of physical properties is certainly not the final idea, not the best idea, but it's somewhere to begin with. So what is it about chemical properties which makes it so important that we classify elements on the basis of their chemical properties? We take just one activity, one example, and see how important it is to use chemical properties to classify elements. Let us take a metal and a non-metal and burn it in oxygen. So what do we do? We take a magnesium ribbon. Magnesium is a metal and you take a magnesium ribbon, hold it with a pair of tongs and bring it on a flame. When you bring it on a flame, you know that the magnesium ribbon burns with a dazzling flame and it gives rise to magnesium oxide which is a white powder. It forms magnesium oxide which is a white powdery substance but it seems it's like the, uh, the strip is getting burnt like when the paper burns you see the black charred part of the paper which is still there which is still stuck to the paper somewhat like that. The magnesium ribbon it burns and it forms a white uh, part, a white powdery substance. You quickly take the magnesium ribbon to a wash glass and you put the you uh, the burning magnesium ribbon, you bring it and allow that powder to fall into the watch glass. Now you've collected the powder which is actually now magnesium oxide because when it burnt in oxygen, it resulted in the formation of magnesium oxide. When you dissolve magnesium oxide in water, it results in the formation of magnesium hydroxide. Now why is this so important? If I take this now in this beaker, I put the magnesium oxide that I got and I have two litmus papers with me. You've done acid spaces and salts, you know what litmus is. You can use either litmus paper or litmus solution. So what do I do? I first take a blue litmus paper and I dip it in the solution. And I find the blue litmus paper remains blue. But if I take a red litmus paper and I put it in the solution, the red litmus turns blue. 
from your knowledge of the chapter acids bases and salts you know that acids turn blue litmus red and bases turn red litmus blue so what do we see that the metal when we took a metal and we burnt it it resulted in the formation of a metallic oxide which on dissolving in water turned into a base and that is why it turned red litmus blue then we took a non metal like sulfur we took some sulfur powder and we took it in a in a spoon and we call it a spatula or something and then we heat it we burn it in oxygen again we bring it over a flame and we find that vapors of a gas start rising that gas is formed when the sulfur burns in oxygen it results in the formation of a gas which is known as sulfur dioxide so what do we do we bring an in a test tube and we invert it over the watch glass and when we invert it over it the burning the sulfur dioxide which is produced it is moving upwards due to heat it goes and it enters the test tube when it enters the test tube quickly i put my thumb at the mouth of the test tube and i have sealed the gas in it now now when i have the gas i have a beaker full, full of water or just a little bit of water in a beaker and i take my hand and i put it inside the water i immerse it in the water and i remove my thumb when i do that the sulfur dioxide which was collected in the test tube it enters the water first in the form of bubbles and then it gets dissolved in the water and results in the formation of sulfur dioxide combined with water to form sulfurous acid that is h2so3 so when sulfur burnt in oxygen it resulted in the formation of so2 and when so2 was dissolved in water it resulted in the formation of h2so3 h2so3 is nothing but sulfurous acid and sulfurous acid is all acids are um, they turn what do acids do they turn blue litmus red so now when i dip blue litmus paper into this solution i find it turns red and then i try it with the red litmus paper also so i put dip red litmus paper in it and i find that no change occurs in the red litmus paper so what do i conclude from this i conclude that when i took a non metal and i burnt it it resulted in the formation of a uh, of an acidic oxide and this acidic oxide on dissolution in water gave me an acid which turned blue litmus red now these are evidences that are so strong that when you were talking of physical properties we were not being we were not giving evidence we were not giving reason for why a certain thing was happening but when chemical properties are observed they give you sure shot answers and that's the reason why classifying metals and non metals elements into metals and non metals or studying metals and non metals is not complete unless we study their chemical properties so in the next video we're going to start studying the chemical properties of metals if you found this video helpful please give it a thumbs up subscribe to my channel recommend it to your friends and please keep returning for more videos in chemistry thank you for watching and bye bye for now